Welcome back. And uh, I'm sitting there crying. I'm like, what's going on? I tell you. <laughs> Uh, it's so exciting to be able to come together and worship today, and uh, thank you so much for uh, just going by how we are doing seats and everything, and uh, we'll be doing this over the next couple of weeks this way. Uh, just uh, uh, please worship from your seats, so you can stand if you'd like to or sit, but don't come on up, but uh, just kind of stay in your areas as we worship Him uh, today, and then when we leave today, if uh, you would plan on being here next Sunday, just put your name right back on top of the seat, and uh, that way we'll know that you'll be here, uh, or you can just email us, text us if you'd like as well. This is what it says in uh, Daniel chapter 4. It is my pleasure to tell you about the miraculous signs and wonders that the Most High God has per performed for me. How great are His signs, how mighty His wonders. His kingdom is an eternal kingdom. His dominion endures from generation to generation. Church, we serve a mighty and a living God, and his kingdom endures forever and ever and ever. And we are here to worship him and celebrate that this morning. And so I just uh, am so excited to be able to worship together with you. You've been staring at me and some of these faces from the other side of that camera <laughs> for over eight weeks. I'd be like this. <laughs> but we're family. We're family. And it's so good to be with family. And today we're going to worship our Father. <laughs> we're going to give Him glory because He has seen us through and He will continue to see us through. So, Father, this morning we thank you. Lord, we worship you. We exalt your name in this place. Lord, as we are gathering here today, we pray that your presence would just come once again and fill our hearts and our lives. Lord, we pray for all of our church family. Lord, there are still many that are not here with us, and we just lift them up. Lord, many of them have conditions that just don't allow for them to be with us today. We just pray that as they're watching, as they're viewing with us live, Lord, that the same spirit would just come <laughs> and touch them. Lord, we love you today. We give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's worship him in this place this morning. You can stand if you want. You can sit if you want, however you feel comfortable. But let's give him glory today.
Lord, we praise you. We glorify you, Lord God. We shout your name in this place that you are Lord, that you are God. Hallelujah. We bless your name, Jesus. We bless your name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He is worthy of all of our praise. Amen. Amen. Do me a favor. Stick your hand up. Go like this. You just waved to everybody. Turn around if you want. Just wave. There's faces you haven't seen in two months. <laughs> Some faces may be even new. Uh, but uh, it is great to see all of your smiling, wonderful faces this morning. Amen. You can be seated this morning. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Just a, a couple of things we want to make you aware of. Uh, we do have a yard sale scheduled for June the 6th, Saturday, June the 6th, and we are taking items, uh, good, used, quality items, new items, whatever you have. You've probably gone through your house. It's amazing. Some of you um, have gone through your houses. I think we've had four people bring in stuff for the yard sale so far, and I think we could uh, have a yard sale just with that because four people cleaned out their houses, and it's amazing what we can accumulate. And, uh, but if you have extra stuff uh, that you'd like to donate, uh, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, you can just bring it down. Uh, the back door, we will uh, let you in back there, and you can just bring stuff in, and we can help you with it. If you have large items that you may need picked up, let us know. We can come and help pick them up and bring them uh, to the church for that. Uh, following the service, uh, the gas ministry will be running. If you uh, are in need of gas in your car, the gas ministry is out there. Uh, it is uh, $2 uh, for a gallon, so I can't even do math this morning. Uh, $10 for five gallons, because we do five gallon minimum, so they'll be out there following the service this morning uh, if you are in need of that. Uh, one other announcement uh, you saw on the way in, the red uh, offering box, you can place your offering and tithe in there on the way in or on the way out of services. We won't be passing the bags uh, probably for quite some time yet, but uh, we'll be having that. Or you can also give uh, at uh, New Life Altoona, .org, and you can go on there and uh, schedule to give regularly or one time, uh, however you want to give your tithes and your offerings. Amen. If you have your Bibles this morning, we are in the book of John. I started this series several weeks ago, and uh, we're just going to be going through the book of John uh, over the next couple of months, uh, possibly even a year. And I wanted us to kind of get back to a foundation of knowing who Jesus is, understanding the, the a gospel accounts of why he came, what he did, and how it relates to us and the meaning for us this morning. And this morning I've titled it Lamb of God. John chapter 1, we're going to be looking at verses 29 through 34. There's a saying that says, what you don't know can hurt you. What you don't know can hurt you. These past eight weeks, I'm starting to wonder if what I do know can hurt me as well. <laughs> but uh, what you don't know can hurt you. When we're kids growing up, you know, we are learning as we get older, you know, don't put your hand on the stove. Well, how does a kid learn that? Usually it's because they've reached for the stove. They didn't know any better. And so somebody has say, no, don't do that. If nobody was there to tell them, they would have put their hand on that stove <laughs> and it would have hurt them. What you don't know can hurt you. Years ago, while Anne was volunteering each week at a local organization, she met a nice guy by the name of Phil who always wore the same hat, day in and day out. She says the rest of us uh, benignly speculated about the ever-present hats that this gentleman was wearing. Did he ever take it off? Did he sleep with it on? We had a laugh or two about that hat, what the story behind it actually was. One day, feeling jovial with Phil, we came clean. We asked him what it would take for him to take off the hats. We weren't at all prepared for what happened next. Phil's face went a sheen and, and he raced out of the room. We learned later that Jim had endured some something deeply traumatic years ago that left his head horribly and visibly scarred. You see, the hat had not only concealed the physical scars, but it had hidden the emotional ones he continued to carry with him. In a single moment, our coaxing brought up all of the pain 
all over again. You see, sometimes what you don't know can hurt you, or in this case, what we don't know can actually hurt others. This morning, I want to take a look at this. What we don't know about Jesus can be hazardous to our health. What we don't know about Jesus can be hazardous to our eternal health. I find that it is so important for us as Christians, as followers of Christ, to understand who Jesus is, to, to get a grasp of why he came, what he did for us, and then when he left, what he uh, uh, left behind, as we'll see a little bit this morning, in the presence of his Holy Spirit. We need to know who Jesus is. It's not good enough just to hear about Jesus or to know the name Jesus. We need to understand and have a relationship with him. In the first chapter of John, we have been learning about who Jesus is. We saw that he is the word. He is the expression of God's mind. Jesus is God. We, we see that in John 1. It says he was there in the beginning. He is the creator. Jesus is, we saw that he is the great I am. In verses 19 through 28, uh, the story of John the Baptist comes on the scene. And we learn that John tells us that Jesus is the great I am. People are asking, John, John, who are you? Are you the Messiah? And John would reply, no, I'm not the Messiah. They asked him, are you Elijah, John the Baptist? Are you Elijah? And he said, no, I am not. They asked John the Baptist, are, are, you, a, are you the prophet that was foretold to come? He said, no, I am not. They even asked John the Baptist, who are you? And this is what John said. John said, I am just a voice telling everyone to get ready for the Messiah. I am just a voice telling everyone to get ready for the Messiah. And, and there's so much that we could unpack and just that phrase there, because each of us as followers of Christ, we have a duty to let other people know that they need to be, pre pre be, blah, blah, blah. be it's been a while since I preached in front of people. Uh, <laughs> they need to be prepared for the return of the Messiah. And it's our responsibility to be that light. So this morning we're picking it up in John chapter 1, verse 29. John identifies who this Messiah is. Follow along as we read verses 29 to 34. It says, the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I meant when I said, a man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. Verse 32. Then John gave this testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. And I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, the man whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and I testify that this is God's chosen one. John is saying, I have seen and I am telling you that I am not the one, but this man Jesus is the one. I remember back to when I first memorized uh, verse number 29. Uh, I, back in the day, everything was kind of memorized in King James Version. Uh, the other new versions and translations weren't really out on the market too much. But I remember memorizing in the King James. In the King James, it says this, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Behold. And, and there's this exclamation with that word behold in the original greek we we find that that word behold is is something that is used to draw attention in the the that passage we just read it says look but if john the baptist if you can picture this scene with me john the baptist is out there he's on a mountainside and the crowd is around him and john is teaching about repentance repent for your sins repent for your sins you need to repent but there is coming one I love this. John is in the middle of teaching this. There is coming one who I am unworthy to even untie his sandals. And as he's teaching this, here comes Jesus <laughs> with his disciples walking up to the mountainside. And John, in the middle of his teaching, he, he'd probably be saying, and this is what the Lord says in the Old Testament. Uh, King David said this, and behold, he just stopped. Behold, <laughs> look. Lift up your eyes. Don't look at me anymore. Take notice of the one that is coming. It's not about me anymore. 
John's saying, behold, here comes Jesus. It wasn't just, oh, by the way, I think that might be the dude over there. <laughs> I'm not really sure yet, but it, it, it could be him. No, he, he is emphatic. Behold, here comes Jesus. John was pointing the crowd to look at Jesus. Take your eyes. This is so important for us today. Take your eyes off of the man and put them on God. Take your eyes off of me. I'm just a voice. And we need to be a voice to point people to Jesus. But our voice needs to say, no, look to God. Look to Jesus. Here comes Jesus. Look at him. John was pointing the crowd to look at Jesus. That's what we need to do. And that's what I want to do in this message this morning. We're going to look to the Lamb of God. And I want us to learn three things about Jesus this morning. Here's the first one. Jesus is God's Lamb to take away our sin. Jesus is God's Lamb to take away our sin. John said, here is the Lamb of God. In verse uh, 29 there, here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John's out in the wilderness, out in the desert. He's teaching and preaching. And he says, behold. Behold, look, there's the Lamb of God. If you do a quick search in a Bible app, you'll find the words lamb, sheep, or flock in the Bible over 600 times. It talks about lamb and sheep and flocks. But if you did a search for how many times the phrase the Lamb of God appears, it only appears twice. Over 600 times we read about lambs, sheep, and flocks, but only twice do we read about the Lamb of God. The first one is here in verse number 29, and, and then again in verse 36, John repeats it. So I want us to take a look at this concept of the Lamb of God. Why did John say, here is the Lamb of God? You see, in the Old Testament, the question being asked was always, where is the Lamb? They were always saying, where is the lamb? Where is the lamb? Where, where is the lamb that we're going to sacrifice? When you read and study the Old Testament and the New Testament, you find that they fit perfectly together. Church, without the Old Testament, we couldn't appreciate the New Testament. Without the Old Testament, we wouldn't really understand the purpose of what we read in the New Testament. When I read the Old Testament, I find that it asks a lot of questions. If you read through the Old Testament, I, I found myself saying, well, I don't get that. Why is that? <laughs> and you don't find out the answer until you get to the New Testament. The Old Testament asks a lot of questions, and it's in the New Testament that we find the answer. For instance, Cain asked God, am I my brother's keeper? Am I my brother's keeper? Like, am I responsible for him? When we get to the New Testament, we find that Jesus tells us that we are to love our neighbors as ourselves. So, yeah, we need to love them. We need to care for them and have compassion on them. In the Old Testament, it asks the, the question in Job, if a man dies, will he live again? God, if a man dies, is he going to live again? Well, the New Testament answer for that, Jesus says this. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he were dead, Yet shall he live. <laughs> so the Old Testament says, if a guy dies, is he going to live again? And Jesus says, oh yeah, I'm the resurrection and the life. You're going to be dead in the, the physical sense, but man, if you are in me, you will live again. In my mind, the most important question of the Old Testament comes when we look at Genesis chapter 22. God tells Abraham, Abraham, I want you to take your son. I want you to go up the mountain and I want you to place him on a, a uh, uh, an altar of rocks, and I want you to kill your son. <laughs> it blows my mind when I think about that. As they're making their way up the mountain, up Mount Moriah, Isaac is carrying the wood. He has the fire for the sacrifice, but he notices something is missing. They don't have a lamb. So Isaac asks, he says, hey, Dad, <laughs> where is the lamb for the sacrifice? Isaac didn't know that he was going to be the lamb that day. Now, Abraham could have said, well, son, I, I haven't told you, but you're the lamb. I'm going to kill you today. <laughs> I'm going to sacrifice you just to prove that I love my God. 
on the surface, the question would probably be asking ourselves is, what kind of a deranged father would do this? (laughs) Who in the world would take their son up and sacrifice him? Who'd be willing to do that just to please their God? And then the Old Testament, we're like, I don't really understand that. And I've wrestled with that a lot of times in my own life. Like, how could Abraham do this? But when we get to the New Testament in the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, verse 19, it gives us the answer. It tells us that Abraham had, had such powerful faith that he believed that even if he killed his son, that God would raise him back to life. God, why, why would I kill my son? Because... I have faith that even if I raise that knife and kill him, that God will raise him back to life. So when Isaac asked the question, where is the lamb? Abraham was making a prophetic statement. He said, God will provide a lamb. God will provide. It's a kind of a, a short-term fulfillment of the prophecy because when the angel stopped Abraham, Abraham raised the, the knife and the angel said, no, don't. Look over there, and over in the thicket, there was a ram that had been caught. You see, God provided the sacrifice because Abraham had faith to trust that God would provide. You see, the question of the Old Testament is, where is the lamb? The answer in the New Testament is, here is the lamb of God. Behold, John says, here is the lamb of God. Abraham told Isaac, God will provide a lamb. 2,000 years later, God did provide a lamb, and the lamb was Jesus. He wasn't just a ram in a thicket. Jesus was the lamb of God wearing a crown of thorns. Think about that for a minute. The ram was caught in the thicket. The ram was caught in a bunch of thorn bushes. The lamb of God came wearing a crown of thorns. You see, we can't have the New Testament without the Old Testament. We can't have the Old Testament without the New Testament to kind of give us light and prophetic understanding of what God was doing from the beginning. Where is the lamb? Here he is. The same slopes of the mountain where Abraham took his son Isaac, the Bible tells us that Jesus died as a substitute for our sins. Church, Jesus wasn't just a lamb of God. Jesus is the one and only lamb of God. (laughs) He wasn't just a lamb sent to forgive a couple people sins. No, he was the lamb of God sent to forgive all of our sins. For hundreds of years, the, the Jews had sacrificed hundreds and thousands, millions of lambs and bulls. But this lamb was unique. Jesus is the lamb of God. All the temple sacrifices were to cover over the sins of the Israelites. The sins weren't even, the the sins weren't actually forgiven, okay? When they would sacrifice the animal, it was to cover over their sins. It was a symbolic, okay, our sins for this year are covered over. It didn't actually take away their sins. But when Jesus came, his sacrifice on the cross, him dying on the cross, wasn't to cover over our sins. It was to cleanse us. It was to purify us. It was to take away our sins. John made an earth-shattering claim about the Lamb of God when he said this. He said, he will take away the sin of the entire world. I love that. He said, he will take away. You know what that means? It's in the present tense. It means that God is still taking away the sin of the world through his son, Jesus Christ. (laughs) If you've sinned, if you've messed up, Lord, forgive me. I've sinned. I've made a mistake. God doesn't look down and go, well, you know what? I did it 2,000 years ago for them, but too late for you. (laughs) No, he says, my blood of my son that's been sacrificed, that's been shed. Yes, it's there to forgive you of your sins today. It doesn't say he will take away. It says he is doing it now. He takes away the sin of the world. I think it's amazing that Jesus takes away the sin of the world. But the only sin that we really should be concerned about is our own sin. Isn't it amazing? My wife and I had a conversation the other night uh, and uh, how easy it is to point out the sins of other people. (laughs) How easy it is to find fault in everybody else. When all along, how much fault and sin do we actually have in our lives? You see, we worry and we're concerned about the world, but man, what about us? Lord, forgive me of my sin. Forgive me, cleanse me of my sin. He came to take away your sin. He came to take away 
my sin. My sin. Charles Spurgeon was one of the greatest preachers of the 19th century. Even though he was the son of a, and the grandson of great preachers. Charles Spurgeon actually struggled with the concept of salvation in his life. He had read many books that presented the gospel, but none of those books helped him to understand how he could yield his life to the Lord. He tells how he agonized over his sins so much that he wondered if he was actually mentally unbalanced. When Spurgeon was 15, he was walking to his father's church, but a great snowstorm had come and he couldn't make it to the church. So he turned down a side alley to a small primitive Methodist church. He says there was only about 15 people in attendance and the preacher was a sincere but very uneducated man. That morning he was preaching from Isaiah chapter 45 verse 22, which says, look unto me and be saved all the ends of the earth. Look unto me and be saved all the ends of the earth. Spurgeon recalled the word of the preacher. He said, my friends, this is simple. It says, look. Now look and don't take a great deal of pain. It ain't lifting your foot or your finger. It's just look. Well, a man don't need to go to college to learn to look. You may be the biggest fool, and yet you can look. A man needn't be worth a thousand pounds a year to be able to look. Anyone can look. Even a child can look. Then the preacher looked directly at Spurgeon and said, Young man, you look very miserable, (laughs) and you always will be miserable. Miserable in life, miserable in death, if you don't obey this text. But if you obey now, if you obey this moment, you will be saved. Then he shouted, young man, look to Jesus Christ. Look, look, look. (laughs) Just look to Jesus. Spurgeon wrote that he had been waiting to do 50 things, but that one word, look, cleared away all the clouds. He looked to the Lamb of God, and he was saved that day. John the Baptist, as he's out there teaching about repentance, tells the people, get your eyes off of me and look. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Look to Jesus. Look to Jesus. So after we look, what happens? After we look, we will see God's approval. God approved Jesus at his baptism. Look at verse 32. It says, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and he rested upon him. Here's the Son of God who takes away the sin of the world. And at his baptism, John baptizes him, and the Spirit comes down. And we hear the voice of the Father saying, this is my Son. (laughs) This is my Son. In John's account, he doesn't record the actual baptism of Jesus, but we can read it in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. These are the words recorded in the book of Matthew. When Jesus was baptized, he went up immediately from the water. The heavens suddenly opened for him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming down on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Our our kids that are in the service with us today they have coloring pages and and they have a coloring page of john baptizing jesus and the dove coming down it's such a powerful image for us to see the father the son and the holy spirit all represented at one time in one place there were two miracles that occurred at jesus baptism first was the holy spirit could be seen descending on jesus like a dove I believe God did this for the onlookers so that they would be able to understand exactly what was happening. The next miracle was the voice of God affirming Jesus as his son. And when we look at Jesus' baptism, there are a couple practical lessons that we need to consider, a couple practical things that we need to take away from this. The first one is this. As a follower of Jesus, will we follow him in baptism? Some people will will argue and discuss that they don't need to be baptized because it's not required uh, to get to heaven. I I really don't have to be baptized. The main thing is I believe in Jesus. I trust him alone for salvation. And yes, that is correct. You don't have to be baptized in order to get to heaven. But if you're truly saved, Jesus says you will do this. You will follow after what I did. He said it's not 
because you have to. It says it's because it's something that we should desire to do. I believe it's the right thing for each of us as true believers to, to, to be baptized, to say, look, I am showing the world that I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. I want them to see in my life that Jesus is number one. At New Life, we believe that the Bible teaches that the proper method is to, 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 to immerse people uh, in, in baptism. In other words, to be dipped under the water until they're submerged. We believe that the meaning of baptism is to identify us with Jesus in his death and resurrection. We believe that we should allow for not to, baptism to be the, the, the forgiveness of our sins. No, we come to Jesus and say, Lord, forgive me of my sins. He cleanses of our sins. And then we're saying, okay, Lord, now I'm identifying with you <laughs> through being baptized in water as a profession of my faith. See, we're demonstrating that Jesus is our Lord by being baptized. Acts chapter 2, verse 38 says, repent and be baptized. It doesn't say be baptized and then repent. <laughs> we got to get the horse before the cart, so to speak. We need to repent and then be baptized. So have you been baptized? Have you been baptized in water? Once you've given your life to the Lord, have you been baptized? Good news, we, have, we now have our own portable baptismal. We don't have to borrow one from anyone. If you're wondering what that big thing out on the portico was, that's our new water baptismal tank. It's actually not new. It's actually old. We took it out of the old sanctuary and made it into a portable one. <laughs> And so we're going to be having a water baptismal service. I'm not sure when, but sometime this summer. And if you haven't been baptized, man, we want to baptize you so that you can show that you're following Jesus Christ. Number two, the second practical thing is this. Parents, tell your kids, I love you and I'm proud of you. As parents, we can learn a great lesson from the only perfect father in the universe. When Jesus was baptized, his father said two things. He said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. This is my beloved son. I care deeply about him and I am very pleased in what he is doing. Moms and dads, it's important for you to brag on your kids personally and publicly. So here's how you do it. Tell them you love them. Tell them that they're doing a good job at something. You see, that's what God said. This is my beloved son. Son, I love you. And by the way, you're doing a great job. I'm pleased in what you're doing. Follow what the Lord's teaching is. Parents, can I tell you the worst thing you can do to your kids is criticize them, belittle them, especially in front of their peers or other people. Yet the best thing you can do is to tell them how much you love them, how proud of them you are. Find something that your kid does well and man, just brag about it. Man, I am so proud of you. You're amazing at that. You're an amazing artist. You're an amazing athlete. Man, you, I don't understand how you can put sentences together and you can write poetry. You're amazing at math. Find something. Brag about it. Because it encourages them. It lifts them up. Some of you might be thinking, well, my kids are all grown up now. I, I, I missed my chance. Really? I don't think so. How old was Jesus when the Father said these things? He was in his 30s. As Jesus is being baptized, he is in his 30s, and the voice of the Father says, this is my son, my beloved son, in whom I'm well pleased. It's never too late to express gratitude. It's never too late to express your love and admiration for your children. Do it today, and do it often. Do it often. Build them up in that way. Here's the third practice for us to incorporate in our lives. Jesus can immerse you into the fullness of the Holy Spirit. John pointed out Jesus as the Lamb of God. He baptized him and God spoke. Then John made, John made another uh, uh, amazing and crazy claim about Jesus. Verse 33, he said this. The man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. People oftentimes get confused about this simply because they, they think that there's only one baptism, water baptism. But remember that word baptize, it means to immerse, to, to completely cover. 
There's a baptism that is more important than actually the baptism water, and it's the baptism in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, Jesus will baptize you in the Holy Spirit. You see, water baptism is an outward act. We're showing the world. But when the Holy Spirit fills us, when we are baptized in the Holy Spirit, it is an inward work that God is doing in our lives so that he is equipping us, he is empowering us, he is comforting us, he is enabling us to be the followers and the voice for Jesus. Spirit baptism is an inner act that purifies the soul, it purifies the spirit. You become holy because the Spirit of God is holy. Spirit baptism is that work on the inside. The baptism in the Holy Spirit is so important that it's mentioned six times in the New Testament. It's mentioned four times in the gospel accounts, and then Peter quotes it to, to, uh, to Cornelius in Acts chapter 10. Church, we don't have to wonder what the baptism with the Spirit is. Jesus himself identified it before he ascended into heaven. Listen to Jesus' words in Acts chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. Jesus said, and he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but wait for the Father's promise, which he said, you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit in a few days. Hmm. John baptized with water, but you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit in a few days. Jesus ascended to the Father. Ten days later, the day of Pentecost occurred. Just 10 days later, on the day of Pentecost, the Bible says that the disciples and all those in the upper room were filled with the Holy Spirit. It was Jesus immersing them into the life and the power of the Holy Spirit. To be filled, to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, it means that we're totally immersed in the life of God. There are many Christians who are still living according to the desires of the flesh. The Bible calls them carnal Christians. Carnal Christian is saved, but they aren't experiencing the fullness of the joy. They're not experiencing the victory that comes from a spirit-filled life. It's like a carnal Christian has taken a glass of, of, of the living water. Oh, look, there, there's living water. They just take a glass of it, and, and they kind of just pour it over their head. Oh, they've gotten wet. They've gotten a feel for the living water. Yeah, they know what it is. But when you're immersed, when you're filled with the Holy Spirit... You're looking at the living water, and it's a big pool. <laughs> and you're like, nah, that glass isn't enough. <laughs> and you take a running leap, and you dive right in. <laughs> and it covers you. The Holy Spirit fills you. He floods over your soul. And all of a sudden, when you plunge into the Holy Spirit, you are filled with his power. You are filled with his comfort. You are filled with a desire to live for God. R.A. Torrey describes the baptism in the Holy Spirit this way. He says, The baptism of the Holy Spirit is not for the purpose of cleansing from sin, but for the purpose of empowering for service. When we're filled with the Holy Spirit, He empowers us to do His work. If you want to know more about the baptism or the filling of the Holy Spirit, I encourage you, read through the book of Acts. Tim Enlo uh, wrote a book called Goodbye Chicken, Hello Dove. <laughs> It's a great book on the Holy Spirit and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You can find it on Amazon. I think it's just like five or ten bucks. It's somewhere in that price range. Call Barnes & Noble. They're open. They'll get a copy for you. And they can drive up and you can pick it up sometime. But uh, it gives a good detail of who the Holy Spirit is and why the Holy Spirit should be a part of our life. Let me close with this. Worship team, you can come up. If you've ever visited a sheep farm... It's pretty fascinating. It's amazing to see how one dog could control an entire, I don't know, are they a flock, a herd? I don't even know what they're called. <laughs> how one dog can control a bunch of sheep. <laughs> how they're able to control where they want them to be, where they need to go. I remember when I was a kid, we visited a place very similar to Bedford Village, and on that day we were there, they were actually shearing some of the sheep. I remember the lamb in the barn had a very thick coat of wool. And the farmer brought him close to him. And the, that lamb was kind of resistant. But then the, the, the farmer, the shearer, put his arms around him and, and pulled him in close. And as he pulled out the shears, 
and began to take the coat off, you could literally, you could see the lamb just relax in the shearer's arms. I've seen it played out several times since then, and I've always been struck about how calm the lamb becomes when its wool is being removed. Recently, I was reading in the Bible, and I had one of those aha moments. Ever had one of those? <laughs> You're reading the Bible going, oh, <laughs> I get it now. <laughs> I had one of those moments. I was reading Isaiah chapter 53, verse 7. This is what it says. The prophet is describing the Messiah with these words. It says, he was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb led to the slaughter, and like a sheep silent before his shearers. He did not open his mouth. The best thing for that lamb was to allow for the man to take those shears and remove that heavy weight, that heavy coat. The Bible says that Jesus was that lamb. He went to the cross. And on the cross, he took our place and the weight of our sin. The weight of our wool that had been on us for years, mangled and tangled with knots and burrs and who knows what else we picked up from the world. <laughs> it says he gave up his life on the cross. And it's as if the, the Father took the shears to our life. Because remember, Jesus was the propitiation. He was the substitute for us. As I thought about those sheep, I saw how being sheared is a reminder that Jesus, he faced opposition, he faced hatred, he was falsely accused, he was tortured, and yet through it all, he didn't defend himself. You see, at any point, Jesus could have called 72,000 angels to come and rescue him. But like a lamb, he remained silent. The lamb of God submitted to the plan of his father. Because he knew that only by dying on the cross would he make a way for the sin of the world to be taken away. Jesus knew only by submitting to the will of the Father would he be able to take my sin away. Would he be able to take your sin away. So Jesus, behold the Lamb of God who takes away my sin. Who takes away your sin takes away the sin of the world. But we have to look. We have to look to the Lamb. Look to the Lamb who takes away the sin of the world. See, that's our responsibility. Are we looking to the Lamb? <laughs> or are we looking to the world? Are we looking to the Lamb? Or are we looking to our own ways? John says, behold, the Lamb of God. Father, this morning, <laughs> I thank you that you sent your son, Jesus. So much within these couple of verses this morning, de declare to us, show to us, and prove to us that you are a loving, caring father. Even though we may not understand why such a brutal death, we do understand that without him dying, our sins could not be forgiven. So, Lord, we look to the Lamb today. If you've never looked to Jesus, can I encourage you to look to Him right now? Look to the Lamb. Maybe in your mind's eye, just picture Jesus on that cross. Picture Him with those arms stretched out, nails in His feet and hands. Now picture... Jesus, he says these words, it is finished. Can you see him saying that? It is finished. Now think of it this way. It is finished. Wayne, your sins are forgiven. It is finished. Ed, your sins are forgiven. It is finished. 
Lori, your sins are forgiven. Can you put your name there? Look to the Lamb. It is finished. Your sins are forgiven. Now just say, yes, Lord. I believe that you died. I ask you to come into my life. And I receive that forgiveness of my sins today. And today I choose to live life. Because as the question was asked in the Old Testament, can a man live when he's dead? And it's replied, you said yes. <laughs> Even though you die, yes, shall you live. So we die to ourselves, so that we might live in you. Come in. Cleanse us and forgive us, Lord, we pray. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He paid the price. <laughs> he loves you so much. He loves you. He gave his life. Are you pointing others? Can other people look and say, Behold the Lamb? Because they see the Lamb of God in your heart and in your life. Well, I want us to go out singing a song this morning. And I'm just going to ask everybody just to kind of wait until... We're done going through this one song. You can sit, you can stand, but uh, we're going to go ahead and dismiss uh, once we're done with this song from this side. And I'm going to encourage you to go outside. Um, I, I'm, I'm hesitant. I'm thinking about letting Mary go out first. And anybody that wants a hug, Mary's available. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but I'm going to encourage you to just kind of just make your way outside and... Um, you know, when you're out there, you want to say hi to some people. That's that's totally on you. But I, I just want to encourage, you know, that we just continue to practice, you know, however we're comfortable and safe. Don't attack people, please. <laughs> there may be some that are like, please stay away. And that's okay. <laughs> My wife's like that normally all the time. Just stay away. <laughs> Not with me. I had to preface that. <laughs> She'd rather fist bump than hug or shake. Let's just put it that way. But uh, anyway, let's, let's just worship him with this song. Let's give him praise because he has given us life today. Hallelujah.
saying, yes, he hears, yes, he hears me when I call. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. You hear us when you call. Our God is faithful. Our God is good. And he is there for you today, tomorrow, and until we see him face to face. I encourage you, keep everyone in your prayers. Keep our nation in your prayers. Because God is the one who's going to see us through this. <laughs> We're going to see that he is faithful through this entire time. Amen. Amen.